the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity's video podcast featuring Father James Flanagan, sole founder. This teaching is called Living Encounters with Christ. We're unfortunately in so many cases we're guided by openly contradictory values. Abortion is one of them. How contradictory can you get with abortion and life? of a child, but they contradict. And what you're doing in this encounter with the living Lord, it brings about a profound transformation as we showed you with Zacchaeus, as we showed you with the woman of Samaria, as we'll show you the next time with Mary Magdalene. To all, who do not show themselves separated from Christ. Everybody will see who you are if you're not separated from Christ. They'll know you. You don't have to tell them all about yourself. They'll know you well. The first impulse to transformation is to communicate to others the richness of the experience that you have in encountering the living Jesus Christ. Share that with people. You know, some people will think, he's gone crazy. You know, he's telling us that he encounters the living Jesus Christ now in his life. Christ was with him this morning. Don't we believe that in Eucharist, that he's with you, that he's in you? and that you're in Him? At least that's what I believe. He's not a Jesus Christ of 2,000 years ago of history. He's right now. I believe that. And uh, I want them to share that. This does not come from teaching as it did to the Samaritan woman. She had to have a living encounter with Jesus Christ. Then she was transformed. So did Zacchaeus. So did Mary Magdalene. So did the apostles when they were called by God. That's what changed them. That's what transformed them. And so with the disciples. It is no longer, as the, as the people of the town of Samaria said, It's no longer because you told us we believe he's the savior of the world. Because they had an encounter with the living Jesus Christ. Don't you see the difference? I mean, we've known about Jesus all of our lives. But we haven't had living encounters with him. The church draws a life from this mystery of the presence of the risen Lord. That's what Paul, that's what changed Paul. He had an encounter with Jesus risen. A living encounter with Jesus risen. And Jesus spoke to him. And then transformed him. And he never changed again. He never changed. I I, I am trying to go along here, but I'm not getting very far. Uh, We want to proclaim the living one, the Son of God, who's living in our lives, who's with us all the time, who became man and died and rose again for us and wants us to follow him as the way, the truth, the life, the light. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe he's your resurrection? And you have him right within you, right now? And he's living? He's an invisible working of a life-giving spirit. He's the spirit of your life. You're not your own. God help us if you are. And you have to have the dimension of the church to encounter with Christ. The living Christ. Christ is living in his church.
And he loves. You know, but you first have to choose him freely, his person, the divine plan that the Father has that he's working through Jesus. I just want you to do what the Father asks you to do. That's all. Because that's your Father's plan for you. And your Father loves you. He wants to please you. And that's why he has a plan for you. And that's what I talked to you about the last time. This calling gives rise to a search for Jesus. And, and that, that's what the apostles said. Andrew and John. They were following Jesus. And they said to him, Where do you live? When Jesus turned around and said, What are you looking for? They said, Where do you live? And uh, they stayed with him a day, and they stayed with him where he lived. And he said, uh, To follow Jesus involves living as he lived. And then they began to live as Jesus lived. And they had to learn how to do that. Sharing his work, embracing the way of his destiny, Adopting the way of his thinking, putting on the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what you're going to do. Because you're going to be the leaders of people. And that's where they're supposed to go. To become like Jesus. And you, the Father has a plan for you. As an evangelizer. In the new evangelization. It involves inviting everyone to communion with the Most Holy Trinity. And this communion among ourselves. Why don't we have communion among ourselves? Because we don't have communion with the Most Holy Trinity. Once we have communion with the Most Holy Trinity, we'll have communion with everyone. It won't even be hard for us. Right now, it's impossible. Now, the burning desire to invite others to come to Jesus living in their lives. Encountered in evangelizing mission. The whole church is called to this. You've got to get others to do it. And that's what you do. In the new work of the workbook of new evangelization. That's what you do through liturgy. And this has been going on for 500 years in America. We're in the 500th year. Uh, it's 2,000 years since the anniversary of the coming of the Son of God into the world. Now, this, this particular point is a, is a very important one. The devil uses a method to destroy evangelization. It's divide and conquer. Split them. And one of the ways that they're split is the gospel and culture. Now, I want to show you an example of that that will help you. Our Lady of Guadalupe came to Juan Diego in Mexico. She perfectly enculturated herself into the Aztec culture. Perfect. Everything, her clothing, everything. All the symbols on her clothing, all the things that she wore were all symbols of a culture. And that's the way you enculturate yourself. There was a, a, a great Jesuit. His name was Matteo Ricci. And they couldn't go into China they wouldn't let the Dominicans in, they wouldn't let the Franciscans in, they wouldn't let anybody in to China. 
And what did Matteo Ricci do? <laughs> he, he shed all of his clothing, put on a Buddhist monk's garment, shaved his hair, and he was considered a Mandarin. That's the highest form of vocation in China, a teacher. He taught the children and families of the kings of China because he went in and culturated into the culture of China. And they accepted him. And of course, the Franciscans and the Dominicans became jealous and they went to the Holy See and asked them to condemn him because he did that. And so they got a letter and they brought it back to China to condemn him. The only difficulty was he died before they got there. And so he's buried as a Mandarin with all the respect of the teachers of China. And they were mad as hatters. And they haven't forgiven the Jesuits yet. I don't know when they will. But he taught the children of the kings because he was a great teacher. He taught them the sciences, he taught them everything. So the kings loved him. But he went in enculturated. So when you go into a culture, you have to enculture it. Now we've been working over 400 years, even more than that, with the Native American culture. And when I first went to a reservation, out in Rosebud, in the Dakotas. I went into the chapel. I saw absolutely nothing of the Native American culture. Not a thing. You see, they thought that it, the Indians were going to become part of a melting pot in America. But the Indians didn't melt. <laughs> They're still there. <laughs> yeah. So after 400 years, the Jesuits said, we ought to try to work with their culture. And they couldn't do it. They just put a few symbols in, but they didn't work with the whole culture. When I went to Belcourt, I said, I, I've got to adapt to this culture. And so I, I said, how am I going to adapt to this culture? So anyhow, I went to the Holy Spirit and to a lady and asked them to help me to adapt to this culture. So I was given the novena in nine days. So I said, I can't get up there and just preach to them like we preach to each other, you know. I said, that won't work. That's not the way they were taught. And so I remember the stories of the chief and how the chief would teach them and how they'd go around in a circle and he would sit there in the midst of them and teach them. So that's what I did. I just sat in the midst of them and I taught them. And Doc Green, who's the tribal chief now, he said, you know, Father, he said, I can't believe it. She said, it took me right back to the chiefs when they taught, taught us. He said, you taught us just like the chiefs taught. He said, we heard every word you said. We could almost repeat them to you. And uh, so I wanted to start a diaconate program uh, for permanent married deacons because John Paul had told us, please, when you go to a native culture like that, adapt to their culture. 
let them teach that way. Because before this, when an Indian went into the seminary, they killed him. They killed him. Their own children, they killed. And uh, so I went to these men. They had all been in the seminary and left. All of them had been in the seminary in life. And because they said to me, Father, we're going to tell you one thing. Please, 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 don't just give us books. We don't learn from books. We learn from life experience. Give us an apprenticeship. Let us go out to the people and work with the people and learn from that way. So I did. They were doing wonderful. Wonder. The people loved it. And they were, would have been great gifts to the Ojibwe tribe and everything and the Chippewa. But the other deacon program didn't want them that way. So they got to the new bishop and asked him to close down the program. So they closed it down. And the poor men were so disappointed. They were so disappointed. They were heartbroken. I mean, if you ever saw Indians heartbroken, these men were absolutely heartbroken. They said to me, if you want us to know what's in a book, you just tell us and we'll tell you what's in the book. We, we don't study from books, we study from life. But we don't teach them that way. In the school at North Dakota, I'd take the children out into the reservation and teach them. I wouldn't take them into school rooms. They don't learn much there. They learn from life. Uh, we are complaining about their homes, but if you took the children into their homes and taught them in their homes like that, boy, you, with life experience, you know, and taught them their reservation, taught them everything that God put in their reservation, they'd be amazed how they would respond. But no, we gotta teach them this way. That's the only way to learn. No, it isn't. Life experience is the way to learn for most people. Now, uh, I, I feel that you have to break the split between culture and gospel. And when you're telling stories about the gospel, you have to bring it into their experience, their life experience. So you have to be there many years before you can really teach them. Because you have to have life experience with them. And then you teach them from those experiences. And we think we do good because the children go along with us. You know. They're not learning. They don't learn that way. And we want to see that there's a unity here with the triune God that we're leading them to by these bringing together gospel and culture. It's necessary, therefore, to enculturate when you're preaching. Use the things that are around you to preach with. At the same time, however, don't forget the Paschal mystery that Jesus went through. Because those realities are going to come into each one of their lives. And you have to teach them life, sufferings, death, resurrection, and ascension in this, in this way. History is the only valid point of reference for all humanity. Life experience. In their pilgrimage in search of authentic unity and true peace. 
America faces the mestizo face of our Virgin of Guadalupe. She didn't appear white like us. She appeared like an Indian. Her face is mystique. And uh, she enculturated her, herself in the symbols of the people. And it's amazing that we're just learning now how she did that and what those symbols mean. And uh, the last point that I want to bring out, you can break this into two sessions if you want, uh, is education. Uh, Sam was talking, Father Sam was talking about education and how important it is. And uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> if we educate them as we should, you know. And, and now we're just finding that home education is the best education for them. The children learn uh, much quicker with home education than they do with almost any other type of education. And uh, I, I was amazed that uh, Montessori education, I had children in the sixth grade who had finished high school in our form of education. Uh, they were ready to go to college in uh, our form of education. They were only in the sixth grade. They were, you know, eight, nine years old. They were ready to go to college. And uh, they just went on their own. And they went from reality to reality, and the teacher would guide them, but they did all the reality. And they had practical life, too. They, they learned from life. And uh, it's amazing, really, when you see the orientation of universities. Uh, I think one of the real difficulties is we're, we're trying to f fit as a, a circle in a square hole, and it doesn't work. Uh, the way we wanted to educate them was in a, in a different way. And uh, we wanted to have them in reference to Jesus. You know, what did Jesus say? How many times do they say Jesus in your, your math class? My brother is a, is a priest, a Jesuit father. He's an absolute genius. And uh, he teaches without a note. And he teaches the most difficult of all subjects. He, he's gone on science all the way to quantum physics. <laughs> but he doesn't teach from the way they teach him. And he, he knows art, he knows music, he knows math, he knows all the various uh, human sciences. And uh, he knows them better than those who use them. No. But uh, he, he doesn't teach in the ordinary way. And uh, there's a great difference between leaders who can teach and those that, wow, well, you've got to get these notes here. I've got to read every word to you. And uh, you have to know uh, politics, economics, science, philosophy, and all the projections of these. Where they're going, how they think, how man thinks. And the Catholic character of all of these. What does the church have to say about this? And you see what happened when Pope Benedict said, spoke about faith and reason. <laughs> and he told the Muslims, uh, uh, you're warlike, you're not f faith and reason. And they went after him and they said, but he's right. He's right. So they stopped and, and started reading from faith and reason. No, the path, uh, one of the things is uh, people don't want to be Catholic today. Oh, we, if they ever knew we were Catholics, they wouldn't speak to us. Well, that's fine. That's their problem. That's not your problem. <laughs> you put out what the Catholic faith teaches. 
That's what Father Johnny Carapi puts out. What the Catholic faith teaches, and people listen. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to put out the Catholic faith as it is. And you don't have to cover it over and teach from the values of the world. You don't have to do that. That's selling yourself for less than 30 pieces of silver. You're a Catholic and be proud of it. And don't try to hide it. And be educated in it. How many of you have read the Fathers of the Church? How many of you have read the Doctors of the Church? How many of you have read the Saints of the Church? That's the Catholic faith in action. And, and that's where the Church went to when it went to Vatican II. It went to those who knew the fathers of the church and the doctors of the church and the saints of the church. That's where they went. And the Holy Fathers. We are gratefully encouraged by teaching in Catholic schools. Be proud of it. And for everybody, not just for yourself. And the influence of these educational levels will extend to all the sectors of society. You want the Catholic faith to leaven society. You want society to change? Live your Catholic faith in its fullness. And work for the education of the poor. I'll never forget. You see, the poor don't get a good education. Uh, it's usually public schools and they have problems with their families and difficulties. And they drop out of school. And uh, so I said, you know, we got to get leaders in the poor. People who are poor who will lead. We had a great uh, Jes Jesuit high school in Kansas City, Rockhurst High School. So I went out to the Jesuits because my brother's a Jesuit, so I figured I, I had been trained by the Jesuits, so I, I said. So I went to the rector and all these men who were in charge of the Jesuits there. I said, I, I got a, a thing I, I want. Would you allow say, a, a dozen students every year from the poor people who can't pay the tuitions that you're charging to go to Rockhurst High School. They can't pay a penny. But I, I, I want them to go to become leaders uh, in the black Afro-American community and the Hispanic community. I want them to, to get a good education. They came back to me and said, no, we won't do it. I said, you know what you're saying? And they said, yes, but we can't do it. They wouldn't agree. And uh, so we don't have leaders. And uh, then you have uh, the candidates that they put up who are poor. They, they, can't, they can't get elected. They don't have enough money for the election. Now, it's essential that every possible effort be made to Ensure Catholic schools the financial difficulties are solved. I don't know how you can do it, but do it. It will never be possible to free the needy from their poverty. Never. You're going to have the poor all your life. Unless they are freed 
from their impoverishment by adequate education. And that's what I was trying to do. In the overall work of new evangelization, the educational sector occupies a place of honor. So don't discount education. And the new forms of education are, are wonderful. Homeschooling, Montessori, all kinds of special developments in education. And this uh, is an activity for Catholic teachers, including in their work, uh, to be encouraged with an urgent appeal to not abandon this field. It's a tremendously powerful field, education, as a fruit and expression of your communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. who are the educators of us all. Certainly we would be strengthened by spiritual experiences that we have. But we want to promote gatherings of Catholic educators at a national and continental level to carry out their tasks. The church in America requires a degree of freedom in education. And you see how they're trying to control it. It is not to be seen as a privilege, a right. The Catholics have a right to education. It's not a privilege, it's a right. In view of this privilege, of evangelizing mission entrusted to the church, the Lord himself with parents must have a fundamental and primary right to make decisions concerning their children. What does the school say? We are the educators of your children. We're the parents. We'll teach you sex education. So we'll teach you how to be homosexuals in the second grade. This is the parents who are educators today, who are not Catholics. Therefore, home education is going to be the way we have to go because they won't change. They've got control, they've got power. And they think that they can put anything in the schools that they want. The function of the state is subsidiary to ensure that education is available to all. That's all they're supposed to do. And respect and defend freedom of instruction. The family is the place where the education of the person primarily takes place. So that's the little teaching uh, I was giving you today. We'll give you a blessing. A blessing of a covenant of communion with the Most Holy Trinity. Of our Father, Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit, our sanctifier, evangelizer, our Lady's daughter, the Father, mother of the Son, spouse of the Spirit, be with you now. Enrique decir, Señor.